servants, I will go. I see the need of people crying. My answer is, I will go. I go to share the message of love. I go to share the blessed Discouraged, I call to Jesus' help because I have decided I will go. Welcome and happy Sabbath. We trust you join the global camp meeting experience this week. Today, we are not offering any local afternoon activities, rather, we are inviting you all to join online via dedicated Zoom webinars, scores of available training sessions, and inspiring meetings. If you missed the Western Ontario camp meeting last weekend, all the videos are posted on YouTube and you can watch on demand. We invite you to join us weekly on Wednesdays for the evening prayer meeting at 7 p.m. Also, every morning, Prayer rooms are open on Zoom at 7 a.m. We are praying for revival, for God to pour his Holy Spirit into our hearts. The Youth Sabbath School class has been added on the Zoom platform Sabbath morning at 9.30 a.m. If you have not received the email, please send a request through our website or ask Pastor Alex directly. Please mark your calendars from June 29th to July 3rd, as the Ontario Conference Camp Meeting will be taking place along those dates. The theme is Connecting Like Jesus. Again, this will be taking place from June 29th to July 3rd. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning, and we thank the Lord that he has blessed us with the Sabbath day. Happy Sabbath, and may God bless you all.
Happy Sabbath, Church family. Please join with me as we bow our heads and close our eyes for the intercessory prayer. Dear Lord, I simply want to begin by saying thank you. Thank you for this Sabbath day. Thank you for this reminder that your presence is always with us as a community, strengthening us to glorify your name. Lord, we've made it through another long week, and we can't deny that it was not difficult in some ways. But Lord, we've prayed, and we've trusted you, and you've brought us this far. And Lord, I continue to ask that you would continue to walk with us further, guiding us throughout life. Lord, I begin by asking for those who are struggling physically, those who have some illness or disease or medical complication, those who are in need of care. I pray, Lord, for miracles, that the great physician will truly step in and bring healing, that they may be restored, revived, quicker than their doctors may even say so. I pray, Lord, that truly miracles would take place as testimonies for your goodness, for your grace. That This community would once again see that your hand never leaves us. I pray, Lord, truly pour out your spirit, your blessings on your people, that they may recover, that they may be whole. But Lord, not only do I pray for physical healing, I pray for the mental health of this church family, of this congregation. COVID has taken a toll, and people are tired, and people are afraid and anxious and depressed and unsure of where this future may be going. And Lord, I pray that you would work on our minds, calm our hearts, give us assurance that even on our darkest days, you are still with us, Lord, in ways we may never see. Clarify our minds, Lord, that the actions we take, the decisions that we have made, may we see where your hand is in charge of it all. I pray, Lord, for this church family, that you would strengthen us as a community, that you would display love in our hearts to one another, that you would show us where to go. God, through COVID, we've lost connections. There are people who have just not watched or stayed close or even know what's going on with this church family. And I pray for those individuals, Lord, that your spirit would touch their hearts, reach out to them, and remind them of the importance of family. That they would see Christ in this community. And for we who are still coming, still watching online, still praying together, Remind us to go out and to display your love to others. We have friends, we have family, we have loved ones who may be distant, who may be a lost sheep, unsure of where they are. We pray for the shepherd to go to them. Lord, we have friends and family and people we love who may be like that lost coin, who are in this church family and yet clueless about where they need to be or who they are, what they should be doing. And so we pray that the Spirit would illumine their lives and show them what to do. And Lord, there are some who, like the prodigal son, willingly just ran off and do not care. And I pray, Lord, that the love of the Father would be a constant reminder to those who are far off somewhere that they can always come home. I pray for this community, for healing physically, mentally, and together, Lord, may we grow together. I pray, Lord, that as this Sabbath will continue, may we truly be revived in the Spirit, prepared for the week ahead, shown that our own lives may be frustrating, we may make mistakes, We may only dig a pit deeper for ourselves. But you, O Lord, hear us. You know where we are. And you'll come along beside us and pick us up again to carry on. I pray a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. We welcome you to our children's worship. 
I want to tell you a story about a young man. A young man who had a problem with anger. A young man who had a problem with his words. We're going to use a few tools to help us learn this lesson today. One is a power drill. Next are screws. And then some pieces of wood. So this boy had such a problem with his tongue and his anger that his dad decided to try and teach him an important lesson. His dad says, every time you get angry or say bad words, I want you to put a screw into the fence. So one day he got angry and he said some mean words and his dad says, remember what you got to do. So he went and got a screw, the power drill, and slowly... He put a screw into the wood. Every day he said something mean or rude or not kind, he put a piece of a screw into the wood. Sometimes it went easier than others, and sometimes it didn't. But every day he did that for days and days. Now I could spend a whole 25 minutes putting screws into the wood, but that's not the important part of the lesson. So as he continued to be this way, Finally, it got to the place that he did it less and less. So once in a while, instead of every day, he would then have to put a screw in the wood. Not every day, but once in a while. And as it got that way, he got to the point that he put no more screws into this wood. And his dad said, son, very good. I'm so proud of you. But what you need to do now is go and remove all of those screws from the wood. So he went and he got his screwdriver. But before he did, he saw some very interesting things. You'll notice that sometimes the screw only goes into one piece of wood. Other times it went through two pieces of wood. The important lesson to learn here is sometimes your words may hurt only one person. But sometimes your words may hurt more than one person. So you may say something mean to your mom, which hurts your dad also. You may say something mean to your sister, which may hurt your brother also. So sometimes even church members, we may say things to one that hurt others. So be very careful. Ask God to help you. So instead of letting the screw build up to hurt somebody, try to ask Jesus to help you not to do that. So when the boy was told to remove the screws, he went and removed the screws. He took all of them out. Even the ones that went through more than one person. But if you come and look closely, what do you see in the wood? You still see holes. So even when you may ask somebody to forgive you for saying something mean, it may still hurt. It may still make them feel badly. Even though you said you were sorry, it still may hurt. So it's easier to ask Jesus to help you not to say mean things, not to say angry things, than to say, oh, please forgive me. But when we do ask for forgiveness, Jesus does forgive us. But people may still feel a little hurt, even though we have asked for forgiveness. So ask Jesus to help you to be kind in the words that you speak, in the way that you speak to others. Ask him to help you instead of letting your anger wind up. Ask him to help you not to be that way, so that we can be good young people for Jesus and be and speak like Jesus asks us to. This is my prayer. Let us pray. Father, we pray that you'll help us to love you more each day, help us to serve you better each day, help us to speak kindly, to speak in love, and truly be more like Jesus. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. Finding peace in your crazy, busy world. We live in a topsy-turvy, fast-paced world. It's easy in the rush of crammed, hectic schedules to neglect life's most important priorities. Gandhi said, there's more to life than increasing its speed. Let's explore four of the most important elements of stress protection, mental health, and spiritual vitality. Applying these four principles will help you flourish instead of flounder as you face life's challenges and demands. They are a lifestyle that promotes peace, attitudes that produce peace, spiritual principles that secure peace, and faith 
that preserves peace. A lifestyle that promotes peace it's not one, but a combination of lifestyle choices and activities that benefit the brain. Many of the fundamental tools for the care and feeding of the brain are everyday matters. Physical and mental exercise, proper nutrition, and adequate sleep will help anyone gain cognitive clarity and emotional stability. Lifestyle choices matter, and especially the ones that we repeat every day. Attitudes that produce peace. Your brain and other body systems actually manufacture molecules of emotion. Molecules of emotion, called peptides, form a body-wide communication system that connects your mind, brain, and body, influencing them all. Actual informational substances called peptides are produced by our attitudes, moods, and actions. These chemical messengers relay information to your immune, nervous, respiratory, and digestive systems. Your thoughts, emotions, and attitudes have a powerful effect on the rest of your body. Dr. Earl Hensland cites studies which show that a trusting, persevering mindset promotes health and well-being. Optimism, gratitude, and joy lower stress, improve focus, increase creativity, create brain connections, aid digestion, lower disease risk, and lengthen life. It's true that happy, perky people get sick. We live in a world broken by sin. But attitude plays a key role in wellness, and we need every tool to achieve and maintain the best health possible. To meet our deepest needs, God has provided spiritual principles that secure peace. Science is validating that need. Spiritual well-being is at the center of a healthy lifestyle. Faith in God, prayer, and religious attitudes are strongly associated with life satisfaction. True life satisfaction does not come with wealth, fame, popularity, or even perfect health. It comes through making peace with God in entering into a saving relationship with Him. God draws us to Himself because He is love. We love Him because He first loved us. Our natural hearts are not drawn to God. We are drawn to Him because of our need and God's healing love which calls us. We connect with God through prayer. In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. Have you experienced the power of prayer in your life? Prayer, communion with God, and reading the Bible build faith and give hope for the future. And that brings us to faith that preserves peace. Faith navigates you through every change in life. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Faith is much more than positive thinking. Positive faith connects you with a personal God who is loving, merciful, and just. God is true to His promises. He will guide you and give you strength and guidance through good times and bad. It has been said that sadness looks back, worry looks around, but faith looks up. Faith connects you with a real God, with a real plan, who cares for you in a very personal way. Faith says, either make the problem smaller or me bigger. God has a plan for your life. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, purposes of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Would you like to experience God's peace plan in your life? You can be strengthened, filled with hope, and changed in your lifestyle, attitude, trust, and faith. God's peace plan is for you. Good morning, church. Today's offering will be for Ontario Advance. During the early days of the Seventh-day Adventist movement, church buildings were few. In Battle Creek, Michigan, they needed to build a larger church to house the rapid growth. Battle Creek had become the center of the Seventh-day Adventist church. 
They needed a place large enough to hold their camp meetings and general conference sessions. Elder James White, one of the founders of the church, thought of a plan. He suggested if each month, each member would donate one dime, within one year we could raise enough money to build a new church structure. At that time, the average price of a home was around $2,000. The members adopted the project. In September 20, 1879, they dedicated the church debt-free. The dime tabernacle became the fourth church structure of the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. This building could seat 4,000 people. Fundraising was simple. Give a dime per month. A dime then would be equivalent to $2.25 or two euros today. Even at today's rate of exchange, that's not very much. Widespread participation brought success. When the members took this as their conference advance project, the Lord bless. What conference advance project needs your support today? When people, when God's people come together like they did with a dime tabernacle, God's will will move hearts to accomplish His will through His children. And He said, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Taken from Luke chapter 18, 27. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, O Lord, for all the blessings that you have provided us. We are grateful for your guidance and for taking us away from harm's way, especially at this time of trials and uncertainties. Father, please bless the offering that will be given this morning. May it be used to spread the good news. In your glory, in Jesus' name, amen. Putting God first can be difficult. What can we learn from Daniel that will help us put God first in our lives today? Daniel was a young man when he was taken into captivity to Babylon, the capital of the greatest empire the world had ever seen. King Nebuchadnezzar always took the best and brightest young men as captives from the many nations he conquered. He would then teach them the Babylonian science and religion, knowing that they would significantly contribute to the expansion of his kingdom. 10,000 young people were taken along with Daniel, and from them, the best of the best were sent to the palace. Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were some of these. Their first test was with food. In fact, since the time of Eden, God's people have been tested with food. Food has been a representation of either devotion to God or rejection of His Word. But in their case, putting God first could have cost them all the privileges afforded them, or worse, they could lose their lives However, these young men decided to put God first, no matter what happened. They couldn't be forced or bribed to do otherwise. Faithfulness with their diets not only gave them superior physical strength, but most importantly, greater mental and spiritual discernment. So it was not by chance that they became the top students in the Babylon University. Later, Daniel would be put in charge of all other scientists, while his three friends would eventually become the top leaders of Babylon's capital city. All this because they decided to put God first. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were willing to be burnt alive rather than compromise. They said, if we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and He will deliver us. But even if He does not, we want you to know, Your Majesty, we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. As an older man, Daniel would rather be thrown into a den of lions than to stop praying first thing in the morning. But God came through again, and Daniel lived to praise him and become the prime minister of Babylon. Daniel put God first. His example compels us to do the same. As the deacons collect the tithe and promise, we are challenged to put God first. Our scripture reading this Sabbath is found in Romans 12, 
verses 9 to 16, entitled Love in Action. I'll be reading from the NIV version. Love must be sincere, hate what is evil, and cling to what is good. Be devoted with one another in love, and honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in seal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Good morning, friends. Here we are once again meeting in our homes and doing sermons in our homes uh, rather than in a church building. You know, the church today is going through a period of survival and what we could call maybe a strange new world, a world where members are wary of shaking hands or giving another person a hug, a world where we need to wear masks everywhere we go, a world where we can't evangelize in traditional ways. So in recent months, we have focused on what we believe is our greatest need, a church which is revived and a people who are renewed with the Holy Spirit. And actually, if we have the latter, the former will unquestionably follow. 
I think that most of you here today will agree that God's Spirit has the ability to transform us to the uttermost. The Apostle Paul wrote about this in his letter to the Romans in chapter 12 and verse 2. And I'll read what he says here. He says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And uh, then in 2 Corinthians 3.18, he wrote, But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. I'm sure that most of you are familiar with the story of John Newton. In England in the 1700s, young John was raised by a Christian mother who raised him in a godly manner. She taught him the hymns of the church, some Bible passages, some of the Bible stories. It was her hope that he might someday become a minister in the church. And from an early age, she taught him all these things. But she died of tuberculosis when John was only seven years old. His father, who was a merchant Navy captain, took John into a seafarer's life when he was only 11 years old. Now, there are a lot of details to the story, but to make it short, John grew into an angry, lewd, and wicked man, and he became a captain of a slave ship, precisely the opposite of what his mother had envisioned for him. But through the years of great depravity, he still remembered the hymns that his mother had taught him as a child. Well, one night at sea during a terrible storm where he was sure that his ship was going to go down, he made a promise to God that if his life would be spared, he would serve him and allow God to change his life. And God did save him and the crew. And John kept good on his promise. He later resigned from the slave trade. And in 1747, he was ordained as a minister in the village of Olney in England. He would go on to compose great hymns such as Amazing Grace and one of my personal favorites, The Glorious Things of Thee Are Spoken. Well, the theme of his life in his later years was always about the incredible change that God had made in him. When we decide to let God's Spirit work in us, an amazing transformation is possible. We have in the pages of God's Word an example of how we can be changed how we can be transformed when we sit at the feet of Jesus, when we learn from him, and when, when we allow God's spirit to infill us. One of the best stories for us, I think, to look at is the story of Simon Peter, because in him there are characteristics which I think we can all relate to. And his story depicts more than any the power of God, the power which enables the very least of us to rise to the pinnacle of what God desires for us. So who was Simon Peter? Well, we first hear his name mentioned in Luke chapter 4. His brother Andrew and John, the son of Zebedee, had been followers of John the Baptist. And when the Baptist pointed to Jesus as the Messiah, they began to follow Jesus. Andrew went to find Simon, his brother, and he said to him, We have found the Messiah. And he took Simon Peter to meet Jesus. Now this tells us that Andrew and Peter had been actively looking for the coming of the Messiah. And they were seeking he who had been foretold in Scripture. And they were spiritually ready to receive him. Now this, of course, had been the mission of John the Baptist, to make people aware of the near advent of the Messiah of mankind, to prepare them to receive him. Peter, Andrew, James, and John became followers of Christ. But they had not yet come to the point where they would leave their lives behind and formally become disciples. Well, sometime later, we find the four men on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, folding their fishing nets from their small boats. They were simple Finnish fishermen, and they had toiled on the lake all night long and had caught nothing. Jesus tells them to cast their nets in one more time. Now you can imagine Silent, he's Simon, he's a little reluctant, seeing how their efforts that night had yielded nothing. 
But he answers, at thy word, I will lower the net. We can read that in Luke 5.5. 5. And Simon Peter witnessed a miracle of amazing proportions as the nets were so filled with fish that they struggled to drag them to shore. Simon was so humbled and astonished that he fell down before Jesus and he exclaimed in Luke 5, 8, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Well, in these words, we can see a glimpse of Peter's character. He is quick to acknowledge the divinity of Christ, and he recognizes that he is unworthy to be in his presence, for he is a sinful person. Well, after some encouraging words from Jesus, he immediately leaves his boat and his livelihood to follow Jesus. He sees that there is a much greater mission ahead in his life than that of a mere fisherman. Now, Jesus sees great worth and potential in Peter. He has a zeal and a faith in Jesus as God's son. If we were to stop here, we might consider him to be ready to lead out in God's work. I think I would look at him and say that. But the Lord is able to see much deeper into a person's character than what we are. He knows that there is much refining work to be done in Peter's character if he is to do the work which Jesus envisions for him. However, the enemy of God has also seen Peter's potential, and he's placed him in his lines of sight. Jesus will later say to Peter, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. Well, from this point on, Peter plays a large role in the biblical narrative of Christ's mission. He always seems to be front and center in the disciples' conversations with Jesus. He's present on the Mount of Transfiguration, and he offers to make altars for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. And it was Peter to whom Jesus told to pay temple taxes by finding money in the mouth of a fish. However, Peter was also the focus of Jesus' greatest disciple rebukes. Jesus had to be honest with him if he was to be fitted for the work ahead. And it was Peter whose boldness caused him to attempt to walk on the water of the lake, you know, likely thinking that being a part of Jesus' inner circle would be sufficient to keep him afloat. Well, on one occasion, when Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must die and rise again on the third day, Peter showed a degree of arrogance in answering, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. Well, again, Jesus had to rebuke him sharply, saying, You are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. And then, of course, we know that at the Last Supper, when Jesus told the disciples that they would be scattered when things got rough, Peter proudly proclaimed, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. And then he said, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. Well, it was Peter who drew his sword in the Garden of Gethsemane and cut off the servant's ear, thinking that Jesus, you know, needed to be defended by the might of his sword. And, of course, he soon denied his association with Jesus three times during Christ's trial. There is a passage in the Desire of Ages which states his mind at this time, and it reads as follows. If he had been called to fight for his master, he, Peter, would have been a courageous soldier. But when the finger of scorn was pointed at him, he proved himself a coward. Many who do not shrink from active warfare for their Lord are driven by ridicule to deny their faith in him. That's from Desire of Ages, page 712. So in these things, we see that even at the close of Christ's earthly mission, Peter was proud. He had a high opinion of his courage. He was presumptuous and arrogant. He seemed to want to establish himself as the vocal spokesperson for the disciples. He was prone to react angrily and without thinking. And of course, he was ready to deny Christ when he was ridiculed. Jesus needed someone who would be a leader in his church once his earthly, earthly mission was complete. And so he needed a born again Peter, a Peter with 
his same zeal and faith, but whose character was refined to eliminate his own pride and confidence in his own abilities. And I think there was a three-step process which Jesus used to accomplish this. First, he had to see his own weaknesses, his need to depend on the power of God and God's spirit in his life. He had to become humble and teachable. And this is why Jesus told him beforehand that despite his proud assertions, he would deny Christ before men. He would be seen in reality to be the most cowardly of the apostles, one who was afraid that people would recognize him as a follower of Christ and worthy of the same fate. And there is, I think, a lesson here for us also. If we wish to be followers of Christ, we must come to the point in our lives where we understand that our courage in the face of adversity does not come from within us. It's not our own strength, but rather it's only made possible through an abiding faith in God. Second, Peter needed to be brought to the point of true repentance. After the resurrection, Jesus asked him three times. He said, Simon, love me more than these? And each question was a heart-piercing reminder of his betrayals prior to Jesus' trial. Simon had to be emptied of self in order to make room for the indwelling of God's Spirit. He had to come to a point where he finally realized that he could not lead in God's work until he was ready to serve, until God did a work in him. We all need to be brought to this point in our lives before God can truly use us in our work and his work. If I enter into his work thinking that I know best how the work should be proceeding, thinking that I have all the answers, thinking that things will be a mess if I don't organize them, then I proceed from a poor foundation and I am planting the seeds of failure. Like Peter, we need to come to the point in our lives where we realize that it's not all about us, but about the ability of God to work through others. And sometimes perhaps those who we think are the least likely. That is true repentance. The third factor, once emptied of self, Peter needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And of course that happened at Pentecost in the upper room. Now that he was teachable, he needed to be taught. Now that he no longer trusted in his own strength, he could trust in the power of God. Now that his tendency to react quickly and violently had been subdued, he could be patient and wait for God to lead. Finally, he was ready to be a leader in God's church, someone who would guide and nurture the church with the love and wisdom that God was ready to impart. Peter had been transformed you know, not that God was finished with him. Spiritual growth is a lifelong thing. But he was now a person who would not be critical of others around him who were engaged in the work, but rather would encourage them. He was now a person who would, with a holy boldness and in an intelligent way, declare the truth before the highest authorities without fear of the consequences. He was now a person who was much more ready to receive advancing truth from God and to change his preconceived ideas when God directed. He now realized that the church did not revolve around him. So let's look at the transformed Peter. In the upper room, immediately following Jesus' ascension, Peter's true leadership qualities began to show through. Not an arrogant, domineering leadership, but a humble, organizational leadership. He recognized that a replacement for Judas among the group of 12 was needed, and he suggested that they vote on who should replace him, guided by prayer. And he also exercised wisdom here in saying that it should be someone who had been a witness to Christ's mission all the way from his baptism to his ascension, because it was important that their evangelism efforts take the form of personal testimony. He trusted in the collective wisdom of the group, and he was ready to abide by their decision. Secondly, on the day of Pentecost, after the Holy Spirit had entered into each disciple, they began to speak in tongues, and large crowds from many parts of the world gathered around as 
they each heard the disciples speak in their own language. Now, one can imagine the noise and the confusion that this was causing in the crowd as more and more people gathered to witness the phenomena. And it was Peter, finally, who stood up and explained the situation in a powerful speech. He describes how Christ was indeed the Messiah who had to die and be resurrected in order to fulfill prophecy and provide salvation. He called them to repent and to be baptized, and that day 3,000 were baptized. And not only that, but the newly baptized were not just left to wander away. The disciples organized continuing fellowship with them. They studied together, they broke bread together, and they prayed together. You can read about that in Acts 42. And on another occasion, Peter and John were going to the temple when they encountered a lame man begging for money. And Peter's answer was, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do I have I give for you. In the name of Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. No hint of self-glorification here. He gave glory to Jesus Christ. And as a crowd gathered who witnessed this, ready to praise Peter, Peter said, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Why do you look so intently at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? His name, Jesus' name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Well, before long, the Bible tells us that a crowd of about 5,000 people had gathered. And Peter used this healing as an opportunity to deliver another powerful sermon. And he called those present to repent and believe. Nevertheless, it was Peter who became the focal point of healing requests among the disciples. You can read about that in Acts 5, and verses 14 and 15. Now, in Acts chapter 4, Peter testified boldly before the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, all of the rulers of Israel. Gone was the cowardly Peter. The new Peter spoke the truth without regard of the personal consequences to himself, nor of the scorn heaped upon him. And the rulers, it says that the Bible says that they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, and they marveled. They marveled at the new Peter. No longer the rude, ignorant fisherman, the new Peter shone with intellect and wisdom and education and confidence. Then we go on further in Peter's story. When Ananias and Sapphira held back money from the sale of their land, and they lied about it. It was Peter who took upon his shoulders the difficult task of confronting them and being the mouthpiece for the Lord as they lost their lives. And that story, of course, is recorded in Acts 5, verses 1 to 11. We are told that great fear fell upon the church as a result of this. And I can imagine that it probably weighed heavily upon Peter's mind for a long time thereafter. Although Peter was a changed man, there were still things in his thinking that the Lord needed to change. He needed to understand that salvation and the gift of the Spirit were not reserved exclusively for the Jews, and so God gave him a vision. Acts chapter 10 tells us that at the home of Cornelius and Caesarea, Peter in astonishment witnessed Gentiles receiving the gifts of the Spirit. His willingness to accept new light totally contrary to his previous ideas, and his testimony of this to the other apostles altered the entire direction of the church's outreach. And then on another occasion, Paul had to rebuke Peter and some of the others for showing hypocrisy and not sitting with the Gentiles when other Jews were present. So God was still working to transform him. Later in his life, Peter wrote two letters which have been included in the canon of Scripture. And as we read these two letters, 1 Peter and 2 Peter, we can be struck with the eloquence of his words and the intelligence of his reasoning and the depths of his spiritual understanding. Let me just give you a couple of examples here. First one is 1 Peter 3, 8, 9. And it reads, Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. 
be tender-hearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing, knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. And then he says in 2 Peter 1 and verse 19 to 21, he says, And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but by holy men of God who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. William Shakespeare and Charles Dickens have nothing on Peter in being able to convey a message with uplifting words and colorful imagery. There are critics today who claim that these letters could not possibly have been written by Peter because he was an uneducated fisherman who probably could not even read, let alone write. And some of these critics, you know, they elevate themselves as scholars because they dissect and they look for supposed inconsistencies. But they forget several things, and I think there are three which are major influences. First thing, for three years, Peter sat at the feet of Jesus, the master teacher, creator of all things. Only the most significant events of Jesus' ministry are recorded in Scripture. But I would love to know what conversations took place in the evenings around a campfire with the disciples. They received an education far beyond what they would have received in the rabbinical schools. Second thing is, it is obvious that Peter and the disciples had studied the scriptures much during their time with Jesus and had memorized much of it. There are at least eight times in the book of Acts where Peter quoted long Old Testament passages in support of his testimony that Christ was the Messiah. Let me quote a few of the passages in the book of Acts uh, from Peter. In Acts 1, 16, 20, Peter quotes David in the Psalms, how he prophesied that Judas would betray Christ. In Acts 2, verses 16 to 21, Peter quotes the prophet Joel, about God pouring out his spirit in the last days. Acts 2, verses 25 to 28, Peter quotes David regarding the fact that Christ must rise again. In Acts 3, 22 to 23, Peter quotes Moses regarding the raising up of a great prophet. And then we read in Acts 4, 11, Peter is again quoting David from Psalms 118, 22, where it reads, The stone which was ejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. In Acts 4, verses 25 and 26, the disciples, and it's likely Peter again, prayed together and quoted David in Psalm 2, 1. Why did the nations rage and the people plot vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. First Peter 1 Peter 1.24, he quotes from the prophet Isaiah, where he says, All flesh is as of grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of the glass. The grass withers, and its flower falls away, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And that comes from Isaiah 40 and verse 8. So we know that the Apostle Peter had gained an exceptional knowledge and understanding of the Old Testament. We should also remember that he was not reading these passages from a scroll. He was speaking them live in front of people. He had them memorized. And maybe that's a good uh, lesson for us to learn, that we should be memorizing more of Scripture. The third point that critics often ignore, they ignore the power of the Holy Spirit to teach, to refine, to elevate the human spirit. That is the work of the Spirit. I think that someone who knew Peter as a young fisherman would not have recognized he who later led the infant Christian church. Not that he likely looked much different, but that his character, his intellect, his knowledge, his whole worldview were totally transformed. Where once his nature was to speak impulsively, now he chose his words with patient regard in careful consideration. Where once he saw his, his position as one to be put in charge to correct others, now he recognized the wisdom of counsel with the group of believers. He was a changed man, and he serves as an example for us if we wish to represent Jesus in this world.
<clears throat> I don't think it applied to Peter only. I believe all of the apostles, including Paul, experienced the same transformation. How else do we explain the initial growth of the Christian church in so many far-flung places in the ancient world? And in fact, uh, let me create a scenario for you. Suppose you were a citizen of small, some small town in Asia Minor in 50 AD, going about your daily business. Uh, let's say it's perhaps Ephesus. And you're worshiping the same gods as the majority of the people. Maybe you have a small statue of Diana in your house. And then one day this fellow John comes to town. Uh, let's say it's John the Apostle. And he begins to talk in the local place of worship or a public square. And you stop to listen. And as you listen, he testifies that he was a witness to a man named Jesus, a Jew, who claimed to be the God of all creation. And he goes on to say that this Jesus was born to a virgin, that he walked on water, that he fed 5,000 with a few loaves of bread and a few fish, that he raised the dead from the grave, that he was able to provide salvation to all who accepted him, and that he was finally put to death, and then he rose again three days later, and that he finally rose up into the air and disappeared into the clouds. Would not your natural tendency be to discount this man, John, as either a lunatic or a liar? What would cause you to believe that it was true, such a story that sounds so far-fetched? You would only become a believer if the words from John's mouth were so convincing, so earnest, so stirring, so intellectually true, and so spiritually moving that your heart was touched in a special way a way that you had never experienced before. I think that you would only believe if the testimony was so powerful and so real and the man delivering it so true and filled with God's spirit, filled with godly love, that you were willing to change your life for it. And friends, that is why the early Christian church, I believe, grew in such an amazing way. Because God had so thoroughly transformed his workers that the Holy Spirit shone through their testimony. Simple fishermen had become spiritual giants. Uneducated commoners had become refined scholars. People, the story of Peter's life with all of his shortcomings, all of his deficiencies were recorded for our benefit. I think we are to see in him a type of our own lives because we all share many of these imperfections in character, which should really disqualify us for service in God's work. But we can also see in his story what the Holy Spirit can do in us. When we recognize our inadequacies, when we repent of how we have misrepresented him, and we ask for God's Spirit to enter us and change us. Each of us can be transformed as thoroughly as was Peter, as thoroughly as was Paul, and finally fitted for work in God's service. Sadly, many who have entered into God's work without first being transformed have often done more harm than good in the work. And today it is through prayer and the study of God's word that we can be changed. So the next time we sit in on a ministry meeting or a board meeting, or we take on some position of leadership in the church, Let's remind ourselves to be like the transformed Peter and not the fisherman Peter. Let's have the characteristics that were described in our scripture reading this morning. I would like to close today with a quotation from Ellen White. You know, she was a, another person who I believe was transformed by God's spirit, just a third grade education. And yet in the school of Christ, she became a far greater author and orator than most people who graduate from the most renowned universities. Here is one passage which she wrote and which I would like you to contemplate. And if there's anything that you take from this talk today and you contemplate and think about during the week, I'd like to be this quotation. Here's what she wrote. As an educating power, the Bible has no equal. Nothing so broadens the vision, strengthens the mind, elevates the thoughts, 
and ennobles the affections as does the study of the sublime and stupendous truths of revelation. A knowledge of its principles is an essential preparation to every calling. To the extent that it is studied and its teachings received, it gives strength of character, noble ambition, keenness of perception, and sound judgment. Of all the books ever written, none contains lessons so instructive, precepts so pure, or promises so great as the Bible. That's from Bible Readings for the Home, page 19. Isn't that a fantastic quote? Friends, may we all continually be transformed by spending time in the study of God's word so that we can be the best that we can be in his service. May you all have a wonderful Sabbath afternoon. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you so much for this beautiful Sabbath day that you've given to us. We thank you for the beautiful sunshine outside, and we thank you for the birds singing in the air. Lord, your creation is marvelous, and we just want to give you honor, glory, and praise for all that you have done. Lord, we ask that you please forgive us of our sins. We ask that you please help us to have a life that is reflective of you. Lord, we pray that you please help us to be able to be a witness to all those who are in need of you, dear Father. We ask that we listen to your Holy Spirit in talking to us to tell us, look, there's somebody who is in need of you. Please go and reach out to them. So, Lord, I pray that we follow and listen to your Holy Spirit, dear Lord. Heavenly Father, we want to uplift our speaker, Randy Saunders, today as he presents your word. May you be in charge, dear Father, of all that he speaks. May it be your lips that are speaking and not his. We ask for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon him and open all of our hearts, dear Lord, to that special message that you have for us. And Lord, as our global camp meeting is meeting this uh, weekend, dear Father, we pray for all those who are presenting, but all those who are listening, dear Lord, may it be a blessing to everybody, dear Father. We thank you, Lord, for your wonderful love and wonderful grace. Please be with all our members who are physically not feeling good, who are also suffering spiritually as well as mentally, dear Father. And Lord, we also ask that you please be with those who are mourning a loss. We think about the Chan family and the Aluta family, dear Father, and we pray that you please be with them in a special way. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for listening to all our prayers, and may you be with us always. We thank you in Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen.